All right, Elissa, take it away. Well, thank you all for joining tonight and and leaving your family or friends, you know, to share the evening with me. I'm really grateful for that. And my name is Elissa Yoderman. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I live in Columbus, Ohio. I'm, I'm right in Wyland Park. Um, if folks know where that is, uh, just south of OSU campus and north of the short north, just kind of squeezed in there. Um, I've been working uh, for Sierra Club Ohio for seven and a half years now. And uh, I uh, am not a guru on the, this, this federal legislation, but I uh, love I love to talk about plastic. And I've done a fair amount of research on the bill. Um, this is my second teaching um, that I've hosted. And uh, I hope that you all enjoy it uh, as much as I do. And um, yeah, and like Chuck said, um, if folks want to like uh, ask a question, I'm fine with having folks interrupt and um, make it more interactive that way and hear from people and kind of have a sense of where you guys are at. Um, and I'm fine with, you know, folks answering questions. Um, like Chuck said, this is um, federal legislation. It's called the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act. Um, and this is uh, a very comprehensive and sweeping bill. And it addresses, uh, it really addresses the root cause of plastic pollution. And it really addresses every, every piece uh, along the plastic uh, life cycle. So it's, it's a really, really powerful legislation. Next slide. Mm -hmm. Next slide. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, here we go. This is just kind of a quick, uh, you know, what we're going to cover. So we're going to do the um, overview, a section by section review of it, um, give you some resources to take action, share share those resources like and how to get them and then open up for discussion um but like i said feel free to answer questions in between next slide so this is something that we do at sierra club i don't know if folks have heard about it it's called um like establishing group agreements or group norms it's just kind of things that uh, we agree upon as a group of folks on how we're going to treat each other and it helps us make efficient use of our time. Um, so these are just some examples of it. Be curious, one mic, um, why am I talking? Why aren't I talking? Just kind of creating a space where everybody, you know, can feel involved. Did we, I don't, Chuck, do we want to have um, people introduce themselves in the chat or in person or? I think in the chat is fine. Okay. We can, we can go to the next slide and if folks want to, you know, put their names in the chat, I can see your names on Zoom. Um, maybe, maybe everybody knows each other except me. <laughs> I, I, I see some familiar faces. Um, so just to put it, just to put this in context of, you know, obviously why, why is this, why is this uh, legislation needed? And, um, you know, this is really because uh, the single use plastic market is just skyrocketing um, and it is really becoming a super polluter. Um, and so by the year 2030, emissions will be the equivalent of 295 coal powered plants. And so when you kind of think about it, about how many coal plants we're getting rid of, it's, you know, like, oh, well, then these plastic plants are, are popping up in their place. Um, and also just to kind of to think about the plastic um, and why we talk about fossil fuels is because plastics uh, begin as fossil fuels and 99% of all of the plastics out there are, are made um, with fossil fuel um, and Globally, 8.5% uh, of the plastic that's ever um, produced is getting recycled and actually turned into something. So 
that means all of it, you know, is, is not making it to the recycling center, not having a second use, not all of it, but excuse me, um, you know, that 91% um, is, is going to waste or uh, pollution um, on land in the ocean or incinerated. And we can go to the next slide. So this is some basics about the bill. So the co-sponsors are Representative Lowenthal out of California and Merkley out of Oregon. Um, and the there is um, a unique uh, process to this bill. Um, and so it really, what it tries to do is, we know that we have seen these plastic bag bans and ordinances that are happening at the happening at the uh, city level as well as the state, and so they've really taken a comprehensive look at that, and they've seen what's working and what's not. And so we have a good sense of you know what's a model bill look like, what does it need to include, you know how thick you know the definition of what a single use item is, how thick the plastic bag should be, if it has a handle, you know, all these little bits and pieces, they've really liked comb through and identify um, some, some really good places to start because we're already seeing successful models on the ground. And I think that's like what is really important um, with this legislation and really the way that it should be, right? Because you have this bottle up, you have this bottom up move, um, you know, bottom up. So things are starting at the ground level. That's who we want to see um, addressing waste because wherever waste is, it's it's going to be most uh, comprehensive and efficiently dealt with where it's created and where it is. And so um, the exciting part for me <laughs> for this legislation is because um, myself and a lot of our Sierra Club volunteers you know, uh, we're living in Ohio, we have a super majority who do, don't, do they don't care about the environment and they can do what they want. And so uh, this moment in time with the Biden administration, uh, we do have, um, we do have some hope that we can move some federal legislation. And, um, and that, that is like the exciting piece is that we can put our energy into something positive. We don't have to do something negative you know, and constantly play defense. And that's what I really like um, about this legislation, in addition to it just being smart legislation. So someone asked, what does BFFPPA mean? So that is break free from Plastic Pollution Act. <laughs> um, to give you guys a background, there is an organization and it's called Break Free from Plastic. So it's the BFFP. And they started in 2016. They kind of came out of nowhere and they've really changed the map um, um, on how, how we address plastic pollution from cradle to grave. They're really supportive of um, grassroots organizations. Um, so if you, if Simply Living wanted to become a member of the Break Free from Plastic Pollution, it gives them uh, places um, to get involved. They have a ton of um, groups all working on different sectors. So there's Petrochemical Hub, there's uh, like real solutions, false solutions, lobbying, state, state policy, federal policy, you know, um, they offer grants, you know, to all these um small grassroots organizations and so they're really supportive of frontline communities fence line communities and those grassroots organizations and that's kind of where the bff ppa has come from we can go to the next slide so i already talked a little bit about some of the unique um unique things about this bill um there was uh, a two-year uh, nationwide stakeholder outreach and collaboration. So they really wanted to involve folks early on um, in the process, understand what it is, um, the, what, what the problems are, what some of the solutions are. This bill was introduced last year um, under that last administration that we won't name. And um, uh, 
it has been reintroduced and improved a little bit um, uh, this year, but it's it's pretty close to being the same. Um, so it was just introduced, yeah. So it was just introduced this year, I think in February maybe was the was the first launch one. But we can go to the next slide now. So I guess I already talked about this a little bit. Um, and so this is, like I said, we're building on a lot of that statewide laws um, that have been so successful across the country. Let's go ahead and actually skip this slide. It's a little chatty. Okay. So this is where we start to get good in my mind. <laughs> so, um, we know right now that the fossil, the status quo is not working uh, for the fossil fuel industry. So the fossil fuel industry due to uh, investments in renewable energy and the electrification of the transportation sector, their profits are going down. Like they're already seeing that. We're seeing, you know, coal, coal plants shut down. We're seeing more more cars that are that are run by electricity and batteries and so that is causing a decline in the use of fossil fuels and so they are really hedging their bets on uh plastics so they're doing this pivot um and they're pivoting to use all of this uh fracked gas especially like we have here in the utica shale um in the Utica shale resource and they're pivoting um to create plastic so they can continue to have high profits um and so here you can see um that it's just like not working so we're having way too much unnecessary use of plastics um, it's not being properly recycled, it's going to the landfill, it's being burned, it's going to the ocean, or we're giving it to other, other countries who are burdened with it because they can't even handle their own waste. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Does anyone know what this movie is? Yeah. The graduate. Yeah, The Graduate and that that scene, you know, I'll give you one word. What is it? Plastics. Um, so like I said, this is the oil and gases plan B in order for them to make a profit. And um, they're just really depending on this market and they're sinking a ton of money into it. And so just to kind of give a little bit of background um, about uh, plastics, um, is that it, the plastic bag was invented around 1976 and they tried really hard. It was, um, you know, the chemical industry tried really hard just to convert all of these grocery stores across the U S to carrying plastic bags and they, people didn't like it. The stockers didn't know how to, or the, the baggers at grocery stores didn't know how to put the bags, uh, put the grocery stores in the bags, the bags would rip, the bags would uh, fall over, you know, all sorts of, um, shoot, I just, sorry about this, I just lost my presentation. Um, so what they ended up doing, what, because it, grocery stores um, were not like getting on the bandwagon of this plastic bag. So they sunk a ton of money into a program called Check Out the Sack. Uh, kind of seems like a, an uninventive name to me. And they went into grocery stores and trained people and trained cashiers and the baggers how to pack groceries, you know, and really, really play up, play up the grocery, you know, the plastic bag. Um, and finally what happened is in 1982 uh kroger said okay we're gonna we're gonna start using plastic bags we've been convinced um and so kroger uh if most most folks 
may know is actually based out of Ohio. Their headquarters is out of Cincinnati. Um, so Kroger is um, the second largest grocery chain uh, in the U.S. behind Walmart. And worldwide, it is considered the largest um, grocery chain if you don't count Walmart that's considered like a big box store. Um, so they have a huge amount of power. Um, and so the reason I'm bringing this up is because in 1982, after Kroger um, said, okay, we're gonna carry the plastic bags in our stores, all of the grocery stores followed. And so now the question is, uh, can we get Kroger, who has committed in the year 2025 to no longer carry plastic bags? Is that same thing going to happen? Are all the grocery stores going to follow? And so um, that's kind of a question that we're curious about and uh, would like to, you know, like see see that repeated. Um, we'll we'll have we it's, we'll have yet yet to see if it will happen or not. Um, but that was when the invention, you know, of the plastic bags, and it really started to change the market because people, um, plastic's lighter, you know, plastic is cheap to make. Um, and so it really started to transform the market and how we looked at plastic. And we can go to the next slide. So is everyone, so now we're going to start going into identifying the sections of within the federal legislation. And so there's kind of eight sections um, that are pieces of this bill. It's a really, like I said, it's a really big bill and it has a lot of pieces to it. Um, it's really comprehensive. It's really exciting to see a really uh, true like um, critique of, of the plastic system being discussed in, in DC on the Hill. Um, with that being said, we know that it's not gonna pass as is, no bills ever do. Um, but what the hope is, is that these sections, you know, there's eight of them can kind of be pulled out and maybe some sections will stay robust, maybe some won't, maybe states can adopt, you know, that section, you know, how they want or even local cities. And so um, it helps you kind of think of the bill within these little subsections of it. And so that's what I'm going to go over now. Does anyone have any questions? Oops. Go back one more slide. Okay, so the first section is uh, a pause on permits. And so this would um, be, this would have the US EPA um, put a three year pause on any new developments of plastic facilities or any kind of petrochemical infrastructure. Um, which is really exciting to see because that's what we want. Like, let's pause it. Let's take a breath. Let's, you know, uh, see if this is something we really want. And then another piece of it that's really exciting for me is that um, there, we're also asking the EPA to look at the cumulative impacts of, of all of these plants, you know, within their community, but then also, you know, take a step back, you know, and, what is it, how is it impacting the United States as a whole and the, and the globe as a whole? And so this would be affect us here because um, we all know that the app, they're trying to um, develop the Appalachian Petrochemical Hub. And so the, uh, the, the industry really has their eye on Ohio and Pennsylvania and West Virginia. And right now they're marketing to turn the rust belt into the plastic belt. And so this is like a selling point that they really try and, and put out there. It sounds rather, you know, <laughs> disgusting to me, uh, but I guess it, it, it's appealing to some people. And another thing that they really like um, about Ohio is that we don't have hurricanes like the Gulf Coast does. 
So um, during the last uh, Gulf Coast, like in Texas, as well as um, you know, tech, when Texas was affected, all these plastic industries started saying, this is why we need the plants in Ohio. Because when Texas got cold and froze, we couldn't have our supply of, of plastics. So let's get Ohio going. And, you know, um, that's not what we want to hear. <laughs> and so uh, the, right now, the two biggest hubs are Cancer Alley on the Gulf Coast, uh, which actually they have now renamed themselves as Death Alley. And then we have the, the petrochemical hub like in the Texas Houston area. And so those are the two really huge ones, um, you know, that are that are just cranking out the plastics. Um, so we can go to the next slide now. So the second piece would be a phase out of all these problematic plastics. And so this is kind of like a low hanging fruit in, in my opinion. And so this is essentially um, either putting a ban on these or phasing them out or putting a fee. And these are gonna be all on these really unnecessary convenience single use items. And so that's a plastic bag, the straw, uh, takeout containers, um, the plastic utensils. And so um, in some some states can even there's enough wiggle room in this that some some states can expand it more to plastic water bottles. Maybe they only want to have, you know, um, your water in a can an aluminum can or your water, you know, in a cardboard box, cardboard container. And so a lot of these can be like expanded upon or narrowed. Um, room for negotiation on how it would be at the federal level. And I'm just gonna point out real quick, um, the straw is the only thing that um, is not considered a problematic plastic. And so that is um, what the ordinance would be as a straw by request, because we have heard from the folks in the disability community that they need these plastic straws um, and that metal straws can be, you know, harmful if someone bites down on them and um, wooden ones, you know, also don't work that they really need the flexibility and the bendability of like the soft plastic. And so we certainly don't want to make life any more difficult for those folks. And so just by switching that ordinance to a straw by request, uh, which we have one here in Ashtabula, the city of Ashtabula. Um, is the only is the only city uh, in Ohio where they do have a straw by request, and that was started by a local Girl Scout Girl Scouts group who got that push through. Um, so we can go to the next slide. So I don't know if any of you guys remember this <laughs> uh, happening, and so I recently watched the YouTube footage of it, and it's pretty horrifying. Um, so, uh, one, one part of this, uh, low hanging fruit in addition to those problematic plastics is an ordinance that would have a uh, ban intentional balloon releases. And so that's really important. Um, uh, you know, I have actually done cleanups with the Sierra club and we have cleaned up a park and there was like a family that walks in, you know, having a memorial for their loved one with plastic with these balloons and you know to it's a really awkward situation because our volunteers are just kind of cringing and feeling like oh you're just like littering this this park that we just beautified and you know they're wanting to remember you know their loved ones and you know um it's kind of hard in that moment what are you so you know the planning's already been done you can't really stop someone you know from having from having this memorial but having a policy to stop it uh, uh would would be an ideal case for that situation so i'm just going to briefly talk about um the uh here i'm actually going to there's a video here i'm going to put it into the chat if anybody wants to take it and uh it's it's a very interesting video. So uh, this balloon release, um, have most folks heard about this or see it or did they remember it or? So it happened in Cleveland um, in, in 1986. 
it was started by United Way and they wanted to have a big promotion as a fundraiser. And then also they were trying to kind of get over um, that, that uh, disaster, um, uh, the mistake by the lake. <laughs> is what Cleveland was referred to. And so, uh, you know, they decided they're gonna have this huge, you know, uh, Guinness Book of World Records. And so they released 1.5 million balloons. And they, they blew up these balloons in the morning and you can see this net, this net is like as big as a city block to hold them in. And they had helium in it. And then they released the balloons and they did not all go up into the sky as high as they expected because it was very cold that day and there was a cold front coming in and it was raining. And so a lot of the balloons went up and then they came back down. Um, and so they were all over the streets. If you watch the video, the, the, the balloons are in the streets. They're clogging the sewer drains. They went over the lake. Um, they, they, some of them went all the way over to Medina. Um, there was like a, a horse farm there and some of the horses like ended up like choking on the balloons. Um, and this is actually um, a horrible turn of events. Uh, there was two fishermen out on the Lake Erie when the balloons were released and um, they actually ended up dying. Um, they're not sure what happened if they got disoriented by the balloons, but the crew, um, the safety uh, research or uh, rescue team could not see them because of all of the balloons floating in the lake. Um, it's just a really horrible, tragic story. And um, they never even got into the Guinness Book of World Records <laughs> at the end of it. Um, so it's just a disaster. We're trying hard to get Cleveland to, you know, get this ordinance going uh, because of this history. I think it would be a good turnaround for them, but uh, that's a conversation <laughs> for another time. Uh, we can we can go to to the next slide. All right. So this is a big piece of the legislation, and this is where the devil's in the details. And I'm not, this is where um, I, I don't know enough uh, part of this market um, to like be an expert or have some knowledge because there's um, a lot of different opinions on, so extended producer responsibility. So this is a portion of the bill um, that um, you can, I'll give you an example. An extended producer responsibility is the bottle bill. So the bottle deposit. So like Michigan has the five cent deposit. Iowa has five, you know, I think there's like eight states that have a deposit. And so that is uh, an example of an extended producer responsibility, um, a success, a very successful one. So when that plastic, you know, Coca-Cola bottle or whoever, I wanna pick on Coke, Pepsi, um, you know, when you buy that bottle, you're paying that deposit for your 10 cents. And then if you properly dispose of it, you'll get your 10 cents back. And so that is an example of this cradle to grave responsibility of a product. Um, and that incentive, you know, helps, helps that, you know, um, be recycled. Because what we want to do is increase that recycling amount of 8.5 more so then we can just keep reusing those bottles you know for bottles again and over in europe where they use a lot more glass some of them will actually put little hash signs on the bottles to know how many times it's been reused um and so that's an example of an extended uh producer responsibility but there's actually a lot more a lot more things that we can do um, like we can ask that any new vacuum cleaners have to be, um, have to be made in a way that have, you know, 3000, 3000, you know, cycle 3000 hours of runtime, or we're basically trying to improve the way that products are made. So things can be repaired 
or things could be um, like if something gets broken, let's say on your vacuum, the uh, hose, you know, something that you use a lot, the hose gets broken. We want to have these manu these manufacturers or producers like hats. We want them to sell a hose to be replaced. So we don't have to junk the entire vacuum cleaner to have it, um, you know, to have it to go to waste and have someone have to buy a new one. And so this is tweaking a lot of things that are already being made, um, but having it more intentional. And then the second one is if we're making products, if you're going to make a plastic product, you need to intentionally make it to be recycled because as the recycling, um, how recycling works now is that products are made and then the recycler like Rumkey is trying to recycle products that were never designed to be recycled. And that's why we see number one and number two being recycled and three, four, five, six, seven is not recycled because they're made the way that they were made has too many things in it that can't be marketed or um, can't, you know, can't be recycled or they don't have an end market. And so we need to have a lot more intentional um, production of products so we can keep it in this cycle and minimize it leaving, you know, to go into the waste stream. Um, another extended producer responsibility would be like cans of paint. And so um, Sherman Williams, you know, sells cans of paint and they're actually required by law to have like X amount of paint take back days, or they have to pay for signage of where, where folks can um, recycle or dispose of their paints. Um, so that's a that's a um, an example of some extended producer uh, responsibilities, and this is uh, like a lot of environmental issues. There's a lot of people that have a lot of different opinions on how it should be worked out, <laughs> and so that's where I start to get a little murky. Is that there's a lot of different ways to do it, um, and I don't I'm, I don't I don't know enough about the systems, you know, to know which one's in right, which one is wrong. But it seems to be that we're all working towards the same goal, just getting there in different ways. Um, so we can go to the next slide. This is also uh, a re, uh, an exciting thing for me. And so this is the refill or reuse uh, market. And so this is what we want to really expand on this market. Um, so you can think about, you know, the refill is like the the bulk, the bulk uh, things that are offered in grocery stores. And so now we also have stores that are popping up called refilleries. Has any been has anyone been to any of the refilleries? We have a couple here in Central Ohio. Nobody. So there's two and Columbus that I know of and have been to. One of them is called Coco. Um, oh, yes, Anne has been to Coco. Anne, did you want to talk about Coco? I don't, I don't want to be the only one talking. I don't want to put you on the spot either. So I don't see Anne coming off mute. So Coco is a- I, I oh. actually, I just figured out how to get off mute. So um, I've been to Coco several times. I really love it. I take back, I save some of my plastic bottles and jars and I take them to Coco and they will refill those. They'll refill whatever you want to take in. They also sell um, very reasonably, they, they sell glass bottles that you can reuse. Um, it's on the west side, uh, and it's a small business. I really love it. I highly recommend everyone to go there. They have um, cleaning supplies. They have personal care products. Um, it's, it's really a fun store, so I recommend it. Yep, so 
like Ant, thank you, Ann. Like Ann said, you can buy sunscreen there. You can buy toothpaste, deodorant, shampoo, dishwasher detergent, cleaning supplies. Um, they have large things. Um, you can buy um, Epsom salts. Um, I think baking soda and baking powder and vinegar and oil, I think too. Um, Cause a lot of those things, you know, we, you can make your own um, cleaning stuff, cleaning items at home. And like she said, you can take whatever kind of container you want there and they just tear it, you know, the weight of your item and refill it. And it is really, really like enlightening, you know, just to be able to be like, okay, I can buy more shampoo because my husband and my daughter do not, will, will never use bar shampoo, <laughs> no matter how hard I try, but I don't have to have the guilt of, you know, creating more plastic. It's, it's really nice. Um, the second one is in Clintonville, um, the, uh, uh, the farm store for city folks, city folks, farm store, they have a small reusable in there and they're expanding upon it. And right now they have um, like the basics, shampoo, shower gel, um, some cleaning supplies, hand soap, that type of thing. And I've talked to them and they're, uh, they're expanding on that. Um, so we don't see, it is certainly a market that is growing. And so I think that I counted, I think actually yesterday, there's 33 refilleries now in Ohio, and I'm sure there's more than that, that aren't listed, you know, that I can find. Um, so it, it, this is really, uh, a really great, um, part of the market that can really grow and create jobs. And, um, some of them, you know, can be high end boutiques. Some of them, you know, like more of the city folks for farms are more just like, you know, um, reasonably priced items, you know, that you don't have to. And so, um, the reuse portion of it, um, Oh, there's a mobile refillery, re refinery, refillery. Where's that? Well, I guess it's always moving, isn't it? <laughs> That's awesome. What's the name of it, Lynn? North Market on Saturdays. Uh huh. Oh, 34. Reduce refill revolution. Oh, I'm, I'm going to have to look into that. I can't wait. Um, so let me look at my notes. What else do I need to cover for this section? Okay. Yes. Next, next slide. Um, so this is a piece that we talked about um, with the extender, extended uh, producer responsibility. Uh, but this is just specifically to have a nationwide bottle bill, which uh, I know so many folks who are so excited about it. I know that we, uh, Sierra Club members, they have been trying from my understanding since like the eighties unsuccessfully to get a bottle bill into Ohio. Um, it is very effective. Um, I grew up in a state, I grew up in Iowa where we had a bottle bill. And so I always collected them and kept them and, you know, offered to take them to the grocery store to get recycled so I could have the money. Um, and so by having it have a, na have a national, um, uh, bottle bill, we don't get all of these comments from the, um, the Ohio Beverage Association or the Chamber of Commerce who likes to say, we don't want a patchwork of policies and a patchwork, you know, some counties do, some counties don't. And we're just like, okay, the whole nation is gonna, is gonna be part of this. Um, I think, I think that there's a good chance maybe this could, this could pass. Uh, uh, I, I would love to see it um, happen. Um, and so this goal, it's kind of fuzzy down here, this post consumer recycled content is so what they're, what the goal is, is when folks are, uh, you know, uh, when they're first, when they're first making the plastics, um, that plastic bottle, um, you know, by 2025, it has to be made of 25% recycled content. And then we keep going up because we want to, like I said, we want to keep having these items 
uh, stay, you know, uh, without leaving into the waste stream, stay within the circular economy and um, keep being made into a plastic bottle again. That's the goal. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Does anyone have any questions? Am I going too fast? Just right. Oh, Sheila. So the, the bottle bill you were just talking about, is that part of the um, Break Free from Plastic Act? That everything you talk about is part of the act? It is. And there is also a separate bottle bill out there floating. Um, I don't know offhand who introduced it. Uh, I, I'm assuming that they think the, you know, break free from plastic pollution act is too big. Um, and so they're hoping if they separate it out, it'll pass. Um, I'm kind of focused on this, so I haven't really looked into it, but I know it's out there. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so this section is really, um, about keeping, keeping the U S, um, responsible for the waste that we create. And so um, we know that wherever waste is produced, um, if it is also recycled or um, disposed of is really the most effective and the, the least amount of carbon is, is produced. And so what we don't wanna see happening is we don't wanna see the US, you know, exporting all of this waste. And like us in Ohio should know why we should not do that because everyone likes to give us their frack waste and their radioactive waste, you know, and we, we openly accept it. I don't know why that's another conversation. Uh, you know, we, ha and we, um, so we don't want to do that to other folks. And, uh, you know, we really saw this, um, a couple of years ago when, countries in Asia were, were finally started rejecting, um, rejecting our, our waste. And, you know, we saw that, um, China was the first one to ban the, in the imports of our waste. And then we started to see all of these other countries. And that was basically because their waste was piling up there, there is, they were not prepared to deal with the amount of waste. Uh, it was no longer becoming an economic gain to take the waste. A lot of it was being burned. And so that's just creating more carbon and more health consequences for the folks there. Um, and it's really harmful. So we, so, um, you know, they really started closing, closing that uh, gate and not accepting our waste. And so unfortunately now, the U.S. and a lot of a lot of countries have now pivoted, and we are now sending our waste to the global south. And so, once again, we're just mistreating. You know, um, we're doing the same thing and mistreating. You know, people in a different place. And like I said, they do not have the infrastructure to be able to deal with their own waste. You know, let alone someone else's. And um, the same thing is going to happen. You know, they're going to have some financial gain from it in the beginning, but then it's going to become a huge problem and they're going to have some negative consequences. And then they're going to shut that, shut that gate again. So we need to stop doing that. <laughs> we need to keep our waste here. Um, so that would be, um, closing the loophole for domestic export of waste to countries that cannot handle it. Oh, this is an exciting one for me to talk about. I get, I get so excited about all this plastic. So this is calling out false solutions. And so these are things that have been marketed to make us believe that, um, that it's okay and things are working. And really the one I should have pen put up uh, at the top is recycling. Um, cause recycling, we just know is not working. Uh, like we said, 8.5% of things are recycled. We cannot recycle our way out of this situation. We cannot, um, just continue to buy plastic and recycle it. 
um, because it's not working. So we really need to start refusing plastic, the whole three R's, you know, recycle, reduce, reuse. Like that first one probably needs to be refused at this point. <laughs> um, so um, the second one is this uh, incineration of waste. And so a lot of it, people will phrase it waste to energy. So they're saying that um, they are taking they are taking all of these waste uh, materials and they're burning it to create more energy. So incinerators love plastic because they're made out of fossil fuel and they burn very well. And so that's the incinerator's job is to burn things. And so they're burning a product that is made of oil that should burn well and does burn well. But the problem is, is we have these incinerators like we, like we do here in Ohio that is in East Liverpool. It's on the border of uh, Pennsylvania um, and Ohio. And it is sited in an African-American, you know, underserved low income community. And that is where we find incinerators, landfills, um, recycling plants, um, petrochemical hubs. We see them all sited in these communities of color low income communities, underserved communities, communities without voices. And that is really um, the key thing that we need to keep remembering is that there is a huge social justice um, equity issue that is all tied with this. And so not only do we have a false solution and we're trying, they're trying to trick us into believing we put it in that blue bin, we're doing our good job, we're doing what we should, you know, but we're also harming a lot of people um, throughout this entire cycle because of the way, because of the places that um, these companies choose to site their facilities. Um, and so that's a big piece for the false solutions, in addition to really calling them out um, as something that is not working. I know we're running out of time. So I do have a real, I should have added a slide. I have a really good false solution that is actually going on in Ohio, and I've been tracking it now. So in there's a company called Pure Cycle Technologies. They have um, are developing a plant in Ironton, Ohio. They have received seven hundred and fifty thousand dollar grant from Ohio or Jobs Ohio. In addition, they have received three hundred and sixty million dollars in municipal bonds from Southeast Ohio. Um, so all of these counties have given, you know, bought into this pure cycle technology. And what they're doing is they're called um, a chemical recycling. Sometimes they call it advanced recycling. But basically what they're doing is they're taking styrofoam and it's really called polypropylene because I don't want to get in trouble. And styrofoam is a, is a trademarked word. So they're taking it. And what they're saying they're doing is turning it into, and they use the words, virgin-like materials. So the problem is Pure Cycle um, is using a patent from Procter & Gamble that is supposed to remove uh, odor and um, taste and color from these uh, styrofoam materials. The problem is, is that this has been unsuccessful in the lab. So they cannot have successful uh, laboratory <laughs> results, yet they are expanding and currently building a, this facility in Ironton for this uh, municipal bond, Ohio municipal bonds for $360 million. 
to create 51 jobs with a product that is not, <laughs> that can't be successful at minimal scale. In addition, they currently have a class action lawsuit because um, the investors um, were not told that the technology is not successful. The, uh, the investors were not told that their stock gains were based, were not based on, on true, <laughs> on true facts. Um, so all of this is going on like right here. And I have been, um, Twittering on Twitter a lot and Ohio jobs, um, knows that, that Ohio, that Sierra club is paying attention and, um, you know, I'll drop in, like, they'll post something about the, about the town in Ironton in the pure cycle development. And then I'll reply to it and I'll say, Oh, does Ironton know about this class action lawsuit? Does Ironton know about, you know, this, uh, this patent that is not working and they will delete just the entire comment because they don't want it up on their, on their Twitter page. So they just go ahead and they delete it and they've actually stopped posting anything about Ironton. Um, so it's hard for me to, to uh, hassle them. <laughs> um, and I have been trying really hard to get reporters to cover it. And there is a um, Ironton Herald who has been covering this. Um, and most recently, uh, last month, Pure Cycle uh, has the city of Ironton. They now have um, a day dedicated to them for Pure Earth, where they do cleanups with high school interns and the high school interns have picked up the trash and turned it into a art display that highlights the underground railroad that went through Ironton. <laughs> so they are really trying to market this, like we're involved in the community. We're like, we're involved with social justice, you know, and it is, like mind blowing to me, <laughs> this is going on. Um, so that's a great, a great, a great local uh, story about a false solution <laughs> here in Ohio. Um, does anyone have any questions? Just a comment, I'm from Ironton, Ohio. <laughs> you are, are you serious? Oh my goodness. Yes, I'll, I'll look into it. I have, um, you know, actually, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll put this in the chat. So I have been tracking um, um, a document um, that I, I kind of tell the story that I told you guys, and I've been sharing this around and I, and I will continue to update it. It's like a live feed and let me share this with everybody and you can read more about it and it will have links to all of these, um, all of the stories kind of that, that explain like the process of it. And so I would love to get, like, I don't know, the video somehow of it made, or, you know, it's a, it's, it's quite a doozy of a story. All right, we can go to the next slide. All right, so this is what I have been keep talking about this um, moving to a zero waste system, which is also called a circular economy. And so uh, right now, the economy that we're in is linear. So we have a take, make, waste, you know, that's a linear, uh, the way that our market, our products in the market are moving. And so what we wanna do is create the circular economy um, and it does have um, less impact, more jobs. And you can see how um, when products are made, they are kept in this cycle or in this circle as long as they can. 
because that's what we want to happen. And we want to have as little of it leaving that circle um, that would go into that waste stream. And so here in Ohio, you know, the shining examples that we have are all of these refilleries, um, used bookstores, used clothing stores, um, e-waste, um, uh, or where people refurbish technology, um, electronic things, like all of these are examples of, of, of things, businesses, uh, within the circular economy. Um, and so the great thing about these jobs is that unlike a coal mine, um, they are not exposing the, the employees to any kind of health hazard. Um, and so we also see a lot of innovative technology like pop up in this market as well. So we see places like maker spaces um, where, or tool libraries where people have um, spaces where they can, you know, there's people there who can teach you how to rewire your lamp so you don't have to go buy a new one or they can repair it. They have repair systems, you know, think about like cob shoe cobblers and, you know, seamstresses and like kind of going back to those things. And how do we, how do we make products last longer? How do we fix things and repair things instead of, um, instead of, uh, you know, throwing them out. And so the city of Cleveland actually has committed to um, a circular economy in over the next 30 months, um, they have committed to moving the city of Cleveland into the circular economy. So right now is the very beginning stages. They've been giving webinars and discussion forums um, about explaining this concept of what does a circular economy mean? mean. They're giving grants to um, businesses who want to join. They're giving grants to organizations working on the circular economy. Um, this, this deals with all those bulk foods, refillery stations, the right to repair. Um, and so there, there is a lot of pieces here for the jobs. Um, they may not be as quite competitive jobs as someone may be paid. Like when they enter the coal mine, but they're not, they also are not going to die at the age of 60 with black lung, you know, cancer. So it's a trade-off. Um, and so a really great example that we have is called um, in the uh, uh, rural action um, in the Appalachian area, like in Athens County has created, they're calling it a reuse corridor. And so what they do is they have um, events like weddings, any kind of celebrations where they give out free and rent, you know, plates and glasses and all these, all these people can host an event with reusing the products that they store for, for them. And then they also provide people to go on site to, you know, make sure that uh, they have the recycling, you know, landfill compost bins and someone's watching that and they're creating these community spaces like the maker spaces where you can have sewing machines, you know, and a drill bit and, you know, it's just a really great innovative way to look at the community and like a lot of us that's the community that we want to see, you know, and here they're really, they're doing it. Um, and so it's, it's totally possible, you know, um, we can go to the next slide. All right. So now it's going to, if it's not doom and gloom, it's going to get doom and gloom now. <laughs> so, uh, right now we know, uh, that plastics, um, have been found in uh, both the maternal side and the fetal side. So these uh, are exposures, you know, to babies who have not come out into the world, but they now have plastics. Uh, microplastics have also uh, passed on to uh, our blood brain barrier. So we are now part plastic. 
Um, and so we know all of these uh, plastics are made of chemicals, right? They're made of chemicals and fossil fuels. So we know that's going to be harmful to us. We uh, don't know, you know, uh, the really long term impacts, but we can all guess. We know that, um, you know, BPA is an endocrine an endocrine disruptor. So we're going to see, you know, lower, lower, um, lower fertility rates. We're going to see, um, uh, more cancer. We're going to see diabetes. We're going to see, uh, neurological disorders, um, all sorts of things that you guys, you know, can imagine. Like, I think that we kind of, I'm trying to like keep my eye on the eye on the clock. So I don't want to go uh, too far longer. Cause we do have a couple more important slides. Um, but we know that BPA is, oh yeah, we'll go to the next slide. All right. So microplastics. Um, so basically, uh, microplastics are little pieces of plastic. Um, you know, so we know that when you have a piece of plastic floating in the ocean, um, this plastic is not going to biodegrade. Uh, what happens is, is the sunlight comes in onto this bottle and it starts to weaken it and it starts to break up the plastics. And then if it's in the ocean, you can think of the ocean waves kind of as a knife um, that's cutting these plastics. And so then all of these plastics, you know, are, um, are, are not going anywhere. They're just going into smaller pieces. Um, and this is how it enters the food, uh, our food um, chain. And so, you know, the little fish, you know, eat the bigger fish, eat the little fish, we eat the big fish, you know, we know that plants are uptaking, um, where or the soil is full of microplastics, our water is full of microplastics. I know that a couple of years ago, we put out, there was a big release that, um, any beer made from Lake Erie, um, has microfibers in it. Um, this is going to, so I'm going to tell a quick story to horrify you guys even more about microplastics. So, um, there's a new, uh, study out that has found out that the atmosphere of the earth, uh, is, uh, now 4% plastic. So how this is happening is um two two things so this has been since 19 you know 62 we have been having having plastic littered and you know littered um it goes through our fresh waterways it makes it it makes it to the ocean it breaks into these plastics and eventually these micro microplastics turn into nanoplastics which are really light so the nanoplastics sit on top of the ocean waves and through wave actions, these nanoplastics will float up into the atmosphere. So now we have 4% of this atmosphere that is plastic. So, um, that is, it's like, it's like a today's version of acid rain, right? So we have plastic rain. So we have the little pieces of plastic that fall down, um, through dry, dry deposition or wet deposition, and we just see this cycle of plastics. Um, the number, the number one reason why we have nanoplastics in our um, in our atmosphere is because of tires. So this was something new that I learned. So tires are going across the concrete, and all these little microfibers from tires are floating into the air. Um, and just causing all sorts of problems. So the scientist has been studying these microfibers and microplastics, and she has found out that every year, uh, for example, the Grand Canyon has 1.5 tons of plastic put into the Grand Canyon every year. Um, and so that's a lot. And so if you think of visual of all these mass microplastics going into the Grand Canyon, so those plastics are going into the soil, the water going downstream, um, eaten by plants or, or eaten by, you know, bugs, eaten by birds, whoever. And so it's a, it's a pretty big situation. <laughs> um, we can go to the next slide. 
All right, so what are we gonna do? We know all this stuff about plastic, we know about the bill. So we have um, some targets here in Ohio. So um, Representative, Rep Representative Joyce Speedy, she actually was a co-sponsor of the bill last year, um, but she is not co-sponsoring it this year. So we are trying to find out why and convince her to come on over and sponsor it again. And then the rest of these folks have been identified by the folks from Break Free from Plastic Pollution as targets who they believe could be movable. Um, and so in August, we are going to do some, um, do some lobbying on this. And if any folks are interested, we would love to have you contact us. Um, and we're gonna try and talk about the federal legislation, but also kind of put it within obviously the context of Ohio, the Appalachian Storage Hub, the spreading of the brine bill, you know, how all of these things are connected to the fossil fuel and plastics industry. Um, and see if we can get co-sponsors, you know, from Ohio, because we have no one in Ohio currently co-sponsoring this legislation. Um, and then if we can go to the next slide. So the next slide are some, some toolkits um, that I've provided. Actually, let me see. Let me provide it. I can send out all this to Chuck too. So um, I have created a Google Drive um, that contains a copy of this presentation. It contains um, talking points that have been created by the bill makers. It's, um, there's like a one page fact sheet. There is like an eight page fact sheet that goes through each section of it. And then there's um, an action toolkit that has sample language if people want to make a tweet or if people want to write a letter to the editor or if someone wants to call their representative and see if they can co-sponsor it. So it's a really comprehensive toolkit. It also has images related to Ohio that you can use on social media or in an email, whatever you want. Um, but there are a lot of great ways to be able to get involved and spread the word. And like I said, um, we are going to be lobbying in August. Um, beginning, beginning August, we'll probably do it throughout, throughout the fall. Um, so we're going to be doing some remote, um, zoom calls with DC aides. And then we also will want to do, um, you know, constituent like here in Ohio visits as well. So, oh yeah, that's my little dog moose. <laughs> so these are all the ways to contact me. Um, and follow us and all that stuff. I do want to, because we are, uh, tomorrow is uh, the kickoff of Plastic Free July. I know I've been putting a lot of things in the slide um, or in the chat. So this is a link to take the pledge for Plastic Free July. If folks don't know what it is, it is um, a pledge that people take to try and reduce their plastic during the month of July. Um, so if you take this pledge, you will receive more information about uh, tips on how to make your pledge successful. And then also all of the events that we have going on here uh, in Ohio. So tomorrow I'm hosting a, one, a Plastics 101. So this is kind of for people who don't know much about plastics but want to know more. Um, we're also hosting two screenings of the movie that Chuck uh, screened last year, The Story of Plastics. Uh, one of them has a panel discussion uh, for Central Ohio folks. And then the other one is going to be a statewide discussion, kind of more of like a book club type theme about, you know, like what interested you, what surprised you, you know. And then we're also going to do another teach-in um, at the end of the month. And then uh, just all sorts of things like blog posts, how to travel, tips on how to, you know, like travel without waste or, um, you know, make your own soap, that kind of thing. It's probably stuff that a lot of folks here already know how to do. Um, and I think that's it. Okay. We will uh, stop the screen sharing.
and let everybody see each other and still open it up. It's what, 8.15 and uh, people can ask questions, make more comments. It was enlightening to me to find out that Ironton was uh, successfully getting <laughs> support from the plastics industry. They're desperate down there and that's what they play on, you know, the whole idea. Mm -hmm. So other uh, comments, uh, insights from this experience of uh, learning more than we wanted to know about plastics? <laughs> I think we did know, but it's hard to let all that in, you know, especially when it gets to the PFAs and the, you know, these awful things, that, you know, the microplastics that I got too much on my screen here. Anyway, um, I really appreciate it, Alyssa. And I think, uh, you know, you're on a mission to spread the word about this. And I think, you know, the, the chat, by the way, will go along with the, you know, I'll, I'll record this and make it available on our YouTube channel. Uh, so it'll include the link to the, uh, uh, to the chat includes various links. And also we can, you know, you can take advantage, you can save that chat. If you go to the chat area and look at the, I think it's the, yeah, the bottom right hand there's corner of the chat, there's three dots. Just click on that and it'll give you the option to save the chat. So you'll have that for yourself. You can save it on your own, uh, uh, your own computer. And, I think we'll have, um, uh, this is not going to go away. It's going to be an ongoing kind of thing. This is a project that uh, I know Sheila's involved in the Citizens Climate Lobby, been trying for these years to, to get people to pay attention and sign on the bills for uh, price, uh, taxing carbon. You know, obvious thing, it's polluting, right? Why? <laughs> now I have to tax, um, plastic pollution that's invading the atmosphere. In any case, uh, it's, it's an issue that is not going away, we, but we're getting more and more people in the legislatures that uh, are willing to, uh, to vote for the interest of people rather than the corporate interest that fund these campaigns. Uh, this is why the state legislature has such a challenge because the, the $61 million HB6 fiasco is really just an expanded version of what they do all the time in the state house. Uh, you know, you can't get them to pass something that, uh, and, and from the beginning, we have adopted fracking uh, way back from the, from the federal level when, uh, uh, when the uh, Vice President Dick Cheney has the quote Halliburton rule uh, to make fracking, uh, not a problem from the point of view of air and water pollution. So, you know, you can't, the EPA is hamstrung by not being able to uh, uh, act on these things. So, so again, they're, they're really dumb policies. Uh, I take heart on the fact that eventually our culture is changing to the point where we recognize that this is common sense. And most people can figure out that, oh yeah, African-American people are humans just like us. Yes, they're a little different, uh, have a different culture, had a different whole cultural experience. So get over it, white people. I mean, you know, it becomes common sense and it becomes uh, uh, critical for all of these uh, areas where we know better and we're not doing better like with climate change uh, because we don't have all the people, because it's not left-wing, right-wing, Republican, Democrat. It's really about common sense policies that any, any uh, uh, Greta Thunberg age person uh, can see. You know, it's not, it's not something that's uh, rocket science, that we're not behaving like we need to do given the crisis. Neither is the media. They don't wanna, you know, you hate to have bad news because people will turn, your, turn off your uh, news channel. Well, we have to get over that and we have to implement FCC rules. Okay, I'm, I'm on my soapbox now and I'm, I tend to go on and on. So uh, I just reinforcing the fact that this is bad news, but that's why we have to have the role of the government uh, to, to take a hand. And I think Joe Biden is finally recognizing that this is the role the government has to do. And it's time for it. We've had 40 years of Reaganomics, 40 years of pretending that 
whatever the private sector does will solve our problems, grow the economy, make everybody prosperous. Well, they fail. So now it's time to uh, have an FDR moment here. Anybody want to debate me on that? No, I think I'm preaching to the choir, but the choir needs to, <laughs> the choir needs to, uh, uh, you know, to wake up and, uh, and keep advocating for these things, even though it's tempting to back off and say, well, it's too much, can't deal with it. We don't have a choice. As Bernie Sanders says, despair is not an option. <laughs> Okay. Does anyone have any questions? I see that Lynn asked about natural materials like corn or hemp. So I guess like I shouldn't have said straight away it is a false solution, but the whole bioplastics is a is a false solution. Um, they're just taking a lot of chemicals and they are making people believe it's compostable. Um, you cannot put it in your backyard. It is going to be there for a long time. Um, it can be taken to um, an industrial composting facility that heats it very high that can be composted. Um, but I, there are there are things um, like hemp that could be made out of, um, you know, like hemp clothes are so much better than all of these synthetic fabrics, you know, hemp bags. Um, like, just think about how can, like your food, how can we take something, you know, from the natural world to our, our world where we eat it or we use it with as little steps as possible. And that's going to be a true, you know, solution. I saw a quote in uh, Yes Magazine and I put it in my update the other day. It says, should I wear plant or, <laughs> or plastic. Yeah. So much clothing is plastic and oil-based and hemp is a plant. Cotton is a plant. So anyway, wool, close, close to grown by animals that uh, eat plants. <laughs> anyway, we can wrap it up if we like, or if there's more questions, this is your chance. Oh, so, okay, Donna said, um, let me put the link. So this should be, actually, I sh that's a good idea. I should just move everything into one spot. Get the link, copy link. So this link is a Google Drive. Oopsies. Um, Where you put everything, right? Yes. So it has that presentation, it has the action toolkit, it has my contact, it has fact sheets and social media graphics. Um, it doesn't have a copy of the free cycle thing, but I will put one in there because that's a really good idea to put it all in one place. <laughs> yeah, and when I uh, upload this to uh, the YouTube channel, uh, I'll include in the annotation these, these kind of links. And I can also send you an email, Chuck, um, with identifying what link is what, and then you can pass it along too. Great. And I'm going to stop the